This is the Physical Activity Researcher Podcast, a podcast for researchers of sedentary behavior, physical activity, and sports. Join for a relaxed dialogue about research design, practicalities, and, well, anything related to research. Learn from your fellow researchers useful and relevant information that does not fit into formal content and limited space of scientific publications. And here is your host, researcher and entrepreneur, Oli Tikkanen. Welcome, everyone. I'm very excited about today's episode as we are talking about activities to improve children's cognition through coordinative cognitive motor movement, executive function skill building strategies, and social emotional learning. Our guest holds a Doctor of Psychology degree from Pepperdine University, California. She's a Harvard trained psychologist, an international educator, author, and a pediatric psychologist in Scottsdale, Arizona. She has worked with thousands of families, teachers, and clinicians around the world to bring more cognitive skills to classrooms, homes, and clinics. She has authored several books, including Musical Thinking and 70 Play Activities for Better Thinking, Self-Regulation, Learning, and Behavior. Ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to introduce our guest, Dr. Lynn Kenny. Welcome, Lynn. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing wonderfully. It's so nice to be with you today. Yeah, it's it's my my pleasure to have you. Yeah, all right, great. We had had the break, some some physical activity, and maybe our brain is is working better now. And and actually, yesterday when I was I was reading about your musical learning, and I got interested on the theme. I I did some research on on Google and and I found out that there are three animals in the world you could say that they can dance do, do you know what what animals can dance wow um bears i think penguins are kind of dancey yeah so so basically this was that they had studied like the animal videos where where animals look like dancing and how much they are in rhythm and basically, in scientific ways, they said that parrots, Asian elephants, and humans are able to dance. And very interestingly, those are the three animals that can talk in some level. And and even, even like there is Asian elephants, they have actually been able to teach them to say five words in Korean and... And then they have tested it scientifically that you can actually say that they are able to talk at least five words. So it's it's very interesting that that there is a link between being able to talk or produce complex sounds and then move in in rhythm with the music. Mm. So yeah, it was it's really interesting. They have been guessing that because speaking is so difficult task that of fine motor movements in the tongue, larynx, jaw, that you are basically getting all the time feedback. The auditory system is getting feedback and then controlling the motor system, that we would have a really close link between between the auditory and the motor system. And this could maybe link also to your why the language learning is important in in, in learning. Well, it's just so fascinating that you brought this up because there's two, <clears throat> at least two important parts of this. One mm. is that when you are looking at uh, children who have phonological dyslexia, basically it, it's a biological state where the parts of the brain that need to communicate in order to read are not communicating efficiently. And in the treatment that we do, the Alexander Integrated Method, the first step of the treatment is to take all of the all of the letters and we say we're going to put them on a boat and send them to an island. And mm -hmm. then the clinicians focus on oral motor kinesthetic awareness first. And they always begin there. Even if the kids are able to move through that pretty well, if you do not have good oral motor kinesthetic awareness, then the mm. higher levels of the treatment don't have a good foundation on which to lay. So it's so fascinating that you say that. And the discernment 
between the specific sounds um, in speech are highly associated with your ability to move your mouth and place your tongue properly in order to make those speech sounds. Hmm. So that's fascinating. The other thing that I'm very, I have always been since 1984, 82, hmm. when I was at USC, which is in Southern California, I've always been very interested in um, low income or low stimulation environments where kids are raised. And I've spent much of my career, and I plan on doing it even more, at trying to get this applied science, the actual what you can do and why you can do it to those high need kids. Because as an example, in those high need settings, there is an enormous vocabulary skill gap. There's in one study um, from 2013, they identified that there's a 30 million word gap between the children from the wealthiest and the poorest families. And by two years of age, this disparity in vocabulary is so significant that it can actually derail the kids from learning. And what's amazing about this is that all you need to do is talk face to face with the children. I learned this when I was at USC and UCLA. As an example, in one study, um, children on welfare <clears throat> were experiencing 616 words per hour. Hmm. And the children from professional families were experiencing over 2,000 words per hour. And while I do not want to rain vocabulary words all over children and overstimulate them, I do another free thing that people can do is just really teach families to look their children face to face and describe what's going on in your world all day long. You know, whether it's, I, I just can give you a million examples, but instead of just feeding your child, as an example, if they're sitting up and you're feeding them Cheerios or yogurt or something, talk about what you're doing. Oh my gosh. And the Cheerios just spilled on the floor. Hmm. How's mommy going to pick those up? Let's think. I think I'll count them as I pick them up. And it's just really important for vocabulary development. It's really important for future reading ability. And then the other thing that's really important related to this is <clears throat> what's what's called your fund of knowledge. So hmm. children in high need, um, specifically low income environments, have a smaller fund of knowledge. And your fund of knowledge is your basic knowledge base. Like what do plants look like? How are plants different from flowers? You know, um, what's happening when it's raining? Just stuff like that. And the reason you need a big fund of knowledge is twofold. One, hmm. we... Uh, really efficient readers visualize as they're reading. So if you are reading, you know, the dog um, put his bone in the dish, you need to know what the dog looks like, what the bone looks like, and what the dish looks like. Because if you don't, you can't image. Mm. And imaging really differentiates. So just getting the kids to the park and getting them to the zoo and, you know, getting them to have enrichment experiences specifically before five years of age is really important as well. And these are just basic things that we can do so much better in society and they're mostly free. Mm, yeah. Fasc fascinating things. Very, very interesting. And when you said like talk face to face, is it, is it important that the child is seeing the face or is it just about, having many sounds basically which are are usually words and sentences that it's just kind of training the auditory system and training the brain to recognize different different things in in language and sounds or or do you do you see it's that important to see the face at the same time that's such a great question so it's very important to see the face for two reasons um there's some research and i'm this researcher's name is escaping me right now um, where they identified that when infants are born, um, during about the first month of life, they're mostly gazing into the eyes of the adult. 
But between one and two months of age moving forward, they're gazing at the mouth of the speaking person. So we actually look at other people's mouths in order to learn language. So it's very important that we look at our children when we're talking. Yeah, is your dog <laughs> wanting to have a break? Uh, if, if, if needed, it's all right. Yeah. She's going to scratch and then make herself comfortable. So let's see. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Um, so let's see where we were. Um, we're talking about so, the language gap and fund of knowledge. And yes, we have to, we want to be looking at our. Um, children and our adults too. You know, a lot of people, Ollie, <laughs> they like shout from the other room. And mm. you just got to have a rule where <laughs> when we speak to each other, we are in the same room and we look at one another. Mm. And and this is with the very small kids. How, how do you see it with the little bit older kids? You know, I don't know any research on that, but I, I think that we want our interactions to be face-to-face. So, so you also have this concept of kinetic classroom. Could you could you give some examples of that? Yeah. So, um, from about 2013 until this past March, I was traveling to about 30. I think one year I went to 50 cities, but about 30 cities a year worldwide teaching motor cognition, and I taught mm. it in two different parts. One is the cognitive skills coaching activities, like actually making what's called brain literacy transparent for children. So in that piece of the work, we actually talk with kids about that executive functions are cognitive skills and cognitive skills can be learned. And we teach them the different parts of attention and the different parts of memory. And we have some activities like in the musical thinking book, we have activities that um, teach the children about their <clears throat> cognitive skills or executive function. So that's one piece of it because we, we are aware that when you improve metacognition, that is a person's ability to think about how they think, just that act begins to improve their ability to implement their executive functions with better efficiency. So awareness is power. We know that. The other piece of the work is I have about eight cognitive motor programs that are created for different types of people and for different types of purposes. Some of them involve reading a visual language, <clears throat> um, the visual language of musical thinking, and some of them involve just like tapping activities and bilateral movement activities, upper body and lower body that theoretically engage SAM. So that's self-control, self-regulation, attention, and memory. So. I usually teach those live in one day or two day workshops and they're so much fun and we're moving the whole time. And I just provide a lot of information about everything, pre-literacy, executive functions, going through the definitions, talking about all the studies. But then two things happened. One is people who took the course would say, oh, I want someone else at my school to take the course. Or, um, you know, I, I was going to come see you in Indiana and I couldn't come. So I took the content and I organized it really compulsively, <laughs> it took me like 200 hours and I made an educational platform. So that platform is called the Kinetic Classroom and people, as an example, can take my current Engage course, um, which is the most current up-to-date uh, motor cognition content for classrooms and clinics, et cetera, et cetera. But there are some concepts on the kinetic classroom and in our trainings that we teach that I think will, you know, you're such an intellectual, I think this will um, lead to an interesting conversation. So some of the concepts in the kinetic classroom that other people I don't think talk about are, you know, one, the relationship between executive functions and achievement and the relationship between physical activity and achievement. And more people are talking about that. But when we look at the musicality, Self-regulation at two years of age can predict in some populations um, spelling, reading, and math in elementary school. So self-regulation is so important that if we do not help children monitor their internal energy, 
um, add more thought to their thinking and movement, help them what I call learn the felt sense of slowing down. If they can't do those things, they will not learn well. Isn't that fascinating? And our kids in our society, even if you watch what people provide for two-year-old and three-year-old children on television, at least in America, everything's so speedy and so fast. These kids mm -hmm. are not learning how to just hang out and slow down. So we use musicality to, and this is very important, we use musicality to teach children that, as an example, we can move and or think slowly, quickly, or fast. And I divide those movement sections into slow is 50 to 85 beats per minute. Quick is 85 to 100, I think it's 120 beats per minute. And then fast is mm -hmm. 120 to 160 beats per minute. And I play different songs and I teach the kids. And then they start through musical thinking in our book, 70 Play Activities, which I wrote with Rebecca Comizio. Mm -hmm. The children are able to start to recognize, oh, I'm thinking really fast or I'm moving really fast or I'm over responding to my impulses and not thinking clearly enough. Just with this simple concept that we are musical and we can move kind of at different speeds. Hmm. And I'm going to let you say something because then I've got more to say about that. <laughs> no, no, please, please continue. Um, okay, so the uh, the two other pieces related to that. This is the funnest conversation, Ollie. This is so fun. Um, the two other things that are related to that are <clears throat> we tend to count, at least in American society, in tens in the decimal system. And when I'm working with children to impact their self-regulation, attention, learning, or behavior, I teach them in either 4-4 four, four time or 3-4 time. And we do not count to 10. We count usually to 4 or 8. Even if I'm teaching in 3-4 time, we're counting four in, you know, either to 4 or 8. And... I really would like everyone in physical education to understand that we need to sometimes teach kids activities in 4-4 four, four, or 3-4 time. 4-4 four, four is the most common time signature. We walk in 4-4 four, four time. We talk in 4-4 four, four time. We march in 2-4 time, but that's just because it's faster. And so as an example, I was on the phone with a kindergarten teacher yesterday. And she mm -hmm. said, I have a student who moves too quickly and is really impulsive, and I really need to help him with your concept of the felt sense of slowing down. And I said, okay, so let's just make up some activities <clears throat> where we can teach this kid how to slow down. And I said, um, as an example, give me an example of something that he does really quickly. And she said, well, he just runs into the classroom after recess and then knocks things over, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, okay, so we're going to um, go up to him and we're going to hold his hands and we're just going to start marching together or we can sway as well. We're just going to march. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Pause. <gasps> so we make this a game where we're mm. having them march or, or sway. I can do swaying with little kids. <clears throat> and then we say, oh my golly, look how we're doing this. And we might you know, clap our hand as we're marching so we can really feel the beat. And then I say, what? So we're counting one, two, three, four. What if we count one, two, three, four? So now we're marching on our right foot or our left foot for two counts and our other foot for two counts. <clears throat> then the third activity is teaching him how to hold a step or a movement for four counts. So essentially you're teaching the child, and I have I do this in my training. It takes about 20 minutes to do the whole activity <clears throat> with the attendees. But you're basically starting in 4-4 four, four time, walking or marching or swaying because people tend to move kind of quickly. On average, we walk at about 100 to 120 beats per minute. And then you slow it down a little bit, and then you slow it down a lot. 
And now you have a language. I call this making executive functions transparent hmm. or making self-regulation transparent because now you yeah, have a I, language. I, yeah. yeah, please go on. No, that's now I can say, oh, are we doing that slowly, quickly, or fast? Shall we do that slowly or quickly? And all the kids we do this with, even the three-year-olds <clears throat> where we – I was playing with a three-year-old one time and I had her walk tall like a giraffe, then sit still like a snail. And I'm a very sing-songy teacher with these kids. And she was doing it beautifully. So we have to teach them. We can't say, hey, slow down. Hey, stop running. You got to actually let their body experience the felt sense of slowing down. Mm. Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting. So you said that you are teaching the kids if they are doing things too fast and usually the cartoons are fast, TV, the, the world is fast maybe now. So you are te- using the music and the rhythm to slow down. For most sedentary behavior and physical activity researchers, Collecting the research data is one of the most frustrating steps of a project. This is why we devised a revolutionary new way to collect data, introducing Fibian Sense Motion, the beginning of a new era. Fibian Sense Motion is a cutting edge next generation system that allows you to easily and remotely collect, store, and manage data. Our solution features a tiny, waterproof device that captures the sedentary behavior and physical activity data, a mobile app for automatic uploading of the data from the device, and a cloud service for managing the data. Even better, all collected data is GDPR compliant, and you have access to automatically analyzed variables of activity types and raw 3-axis accelerometer data. Don't compromise on the quality of your research or the project timeframes. Discover the convenience and power behind our solution at sense.fibian.com. That is S-E-N-S dot Fibian dot com. Fibian, created by researchers for researchers. How do you see, like, what is the kind of how do brain understand sense of time it has to be related to speed of something rhythm of something so do you think it's kind of our innate thing of of sensing time is the the rhythm in a way you know i was reading about this yesterday i was reading about the difference between metricality in music and temporality in music And I still do not, I'm not a musician. I just am a person who plays with and watches kids. And it's the kids who taught me this. So Mm. I don't know technically, and we could ask Bastian Sanek. I I think that he or um, Nacho would definitely know, or even Alex Doman at Advanced Brain Technologies. But what I notice in the children is that if I let them come in and be what I call unconstrained. So I have yoga balls, three yoga balls in my office, and we drum on them. We drum on our bodies and we sometimes drum on these yoga balls. And mm-hmm. if I come in, if I let a kid I've never met before or worked with before come in and just move unconstrained on the yoga ball with drumsticks, Many times, if they have an, a neuroatypicality like autism or ADHD or dyslexia, they will not find a consistent rhythm. It's fascinating. There, it's just very random. Hmm. And so in their randomness, and sometimes it's not the first time because my sessions with kids are short. They're like 15 to 30 minutes. Sometimes it's not the first time, but by the second time, I start to add some meter and tempo to their movements. And Mm -hmm. I call it constraining. I call it rhythmic constraining. And it is fascinating how fast these kids who come in non-rhythmic can adapt to rhythmicity with direct instruction. So, you know, I've got the kid who's coming and he's just all over the place. Mm -hmm. And then, and then I might say, Oh, isn't that interesting? Right. 
two, three, four. Oh, you just taught me something. And then he'll go right, two, three, four. And I'll say, what about the other hand? Left, two, three, four. So I start to constrain them. And then the other thing that we do a lot is in three, four time, what's really cool about three, four time is that you alternate the sides of your body. So right now, if you were tapping with me with your right and your left, and you're going one, two, three, one, two, three, if you're counting, I mean, you're, you could be moving in four, four time, but the counting means right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. And there is a um, pedagogist named Piero Crispiani and Eleonora Palmieri, they're in Italy. And they've written on this. And I discovered this by working with the kids that I wanted them to be working on both sides of their body. And I always want them to do it on both sides. But these guys have a methodology. It's a therapeutic methodology to um, improve um, when kids have really poor motor coordination. And they do this like three day intensive intervention where they're therapeutically doing a lot of the things that I'm talking about. They even teach you how to move quickly and slowly. I mean, it just it blew me away. I was like, oh my gosh. And then I learned from them. I've been talking to them and I learned from them that there's a much greater um, history of motor cognition in Europe than there actually is in America. Mm. And so for Crispiani and these guys, you know, motor cognition is just absolutely fundamental um, to their work. So it's nice that we're meeting people around the world who are utilizing the musicality within children in order to help them self-regulate better, help them pay attention better, help them inhibit their responses better, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. And And if I go a little bit back, you said about that we used to count with the 10 system. Why why is the 10 system not good for some things? And why why would be counting to four, for example, be better? Well, the 10 system, we need to know it because that's the decimal system and that's what all of our counting is based on. <clears throat> and we need to, all the way up to algebra, we need to understand counting in tens. So I'm not saying we totally want to abandon it. We need to know it. Mm. But when we're moving, um, we want to move in four, four or three, four time, because those are times that the body knows. So if I say, let's tap our hands, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, it's not natural. But if I say, let's tap one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, or even eight or one and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and that musicality is really natural and we dance and we sing, <laughs> you know, I don't even know what a time signature would be with a 10, but you know, the standard mm -hmm. time signatures are four, four, three, four, sometimes five, five, four is not standard. But so like in, th I really think in physical therapy, as an example, I tried to do physical therapy for my shoulder a few years ago and I was counting all my movements in eights. So I'd be like, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and switch, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I was getting through my exercises really efficiently. And the, the leader, the physical therapist would come over and say, have you done all your exercises? And I'd be like, yeah, I've done all my exercises, but I wasn't counting to 10. <laughs> um, and also, I'll tell you another really fast story. I was at a school in... Um, on the East Coast. And there was a PE teacher teaching the children how to hit a ball on a racket. And so the ball would fall and they were hitting it on the racket and the balls would go all over the place. I mean, they were just constantly picking up their balls because they were counting to 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So I said, because um, I, I was working at the school that day, I said, could we try an experiment? Can we teach the children to bounce one, two, three, four? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And almost every kid in the room was able to learn how to get the ball bouncing on the racket. Mm. Yeah, that's that's interesting. So it's somehow simpler for our 
brain or it's kind of more natural to count in this kind of things that counting the 10 is only probably good for counting certain things that exist but not not when you're counting something that you are doing am yeah. i am i correct I, that's what i believe i mean there's not a lot of evidence i just it's based on i mean there's not a lot of there are not random controlled studies but you know we see in hundreds of children and even teachers they're like oh my gosh this makes so much more sense you know coming in from the playground just be a giraffe you know a giraffe for eight counts and then be a snail for four counts as an example and you will get the children will have a much better time making the transition um because you'll be using what their body knows well and that is the musicality hmm yeah yeah that's in interesting and and much earlier you were mentioning about about art and mm -hmm. and in a way some task for example note taking on paper which is probably not art but a little bit on that way could you could you tell more about this yeah so as i've been thinking about making a case for keeping physical education i mean we definitely need movement throughout the day we need movement in classrooms but but physical education is a really important field and because physical education's done a really good job moving toward wellness and health and not just tests of fitness it's become much more relevant in our schools but because of budget changes and now we've got about 15% budget cuts because of covid in our educational system in america um we're losing physical education we're losing dance drama visual arts and music and it should be exactly the opposite we absolutely need dance and visual arts and music and physical education and there's a plethora of research that actually shows that arts education and arts integrated education helps most kids not every but most kids learn math reading science and social studies faster better and deeper and it goes back to what you said Ali earlier you were like why does music inspire us why does it make it feel so good well music activates so many different parts of your brain in, including um the emotional tenor aspects mm. of your brain like the amygdala that the arts and music can be used to learn better and more deeply and i had a client about 3 weeks ago say to me i learned my sixes cuz i've got a method called play math it's really super simple it's in the 70 play activities book and i use it sometimes to teach math facts multiplication to children and this little person i work with uh said i learned my sixes and i said oh did you do play math and this little person said no i wrote a song and i said brilliant <clears throat> there's a researcher i i can't remember if it was fleur bauer i'd have to look who it was but she taught hungarian to non-hungarian speaking people and they either learned in a traditional way or they sang it and the people who sang the hungarian learned at a rate of 2 to 4 times faster so singing chanting moving um rapping dancing sketching illustrating these are all really effective ways to help people learn better mm. and and you said about the music and and emotions that they are linked together and i'm i'm quite often thinking about like human beings and some features that we have and like why did we get this in evolution and and for example this link between music and emotions i've been thinking quite a bit and what i have come up i don't know if it makes any sense or it it holds any any truth but you know in the nature if you are the birds are singing so that's kind of music mm -hmm. but if there's some danger the birds might stop singing if there's an earthquake quake coming or or something so maybe the silence is 
a sign of danger and when the birds are singing it's the music everything is probably quite quite good do you think this could make any sense really interesting um personally this is so so funny that you brought this up personally i swim every evening with my husband and mm. i love going out early because the birds are singing and flying. And then as it gets dark, of course, they're not anymore. And I just love the calmingness of the bird singing. And it aligns with this story that I tell in our workshop that have you ever, I don't know if you've got children at home or children in your world, but if you look at like a three, four or five-year-old kid who's happy, they're often humming or singing. Conversely, if you look at an adult who's trying to calm themselves down, sometimes they'll hum or sing. And there's a whole body of literature with Stephen Porges on the vagal response, which I do not understand as well at all as he does. But essentially, mm -hmm. um, resonant sound in your body, like humming and singing, calms the vagal nerve and the vagal nerve is the longest nerve in your body and it's highly connected with your um your organs and so when you calm the vagal nerve through humming singing rocking resonant sounds like om, um you generally become more calm mm. that's that's interesting so resonant sound why why would it be calming for us that's that's an interesting interesting question there was a time I t in one of our books i have this activity that i actually made after i met nacho armani and it's called awe and om and i have the people um deliver an om into their body so they're going mm -hmm, and it's really resonant it feels great and then they do an offering with their hands of an ah and mm. there was a time when I, I can't remember what city I was in. Let's pretend it was Minneapolis. And there was a big storm and there were a bunch of people who were late and they were very stressed out. And usually I do the awe and the om in the afternoon when I'm teaching self-regulation, but I actually started the day with the awe and the om. And I mm. had a handful of people thank me because they were like, their brain was so on fire and they were so in fight or flight because they were late and were they going to get their credit and was I going to be nice to them? And it's just the human experience. And so a little, a little humming or oming or any degree of resonant sound um, can be very calming. Do you yeah. know these researchers at Brunel university in London? No, I don't. I think, um, I think that their Twitter is Savvy Brunel. And if you want, I'll introduce you to them. They are true experts on exercise and music. And they are publishing all the time. They're in London, England. Um, and I follow yeah. them a little bit. I think you'd really enjoy talking with them as well. Yeah, yeah. I will try to ask them. And and actually, interesting, you, you mentioned about the vagal nerve mm -hmm. and fight or flight syndrome. And I've been thinking also this, that, you know, it's very well known that breathing out calms you down. But I've been thinking, like, why is it so? Like, we breathe in and out. So why do we relax, like, every second time, like, breathing out? But then uh, one day, I think it was maybe two weeks ago, I, I kind of understood that if we are scared, we are holding our breath. And when the danger goes away, we kind of... <sighs> So that's the time to relax. So I, I think it could be, could be one one link in the body. So, so yeah, those those are interesting. And usually, there is probably a reason why why something have evolved. Well, you know, in schools, um, Ali, they're always talking about evidence based interventions. They want evidence based interventions, and I understand that. And what I learned working with scientists is that evidence based interventions cost a lot of money. The mm. studies are like five to ten million dollar studies. They take years and years and years. And while we all want evidence and we don't want baloney and we don't, you know, um, it's really important to use your your clinical knowledge and your acumen and, and all the millions of years of experience that we have in our DNA and the thirty years of experience that we have practicing in order to try to 
you know, make informed decisions regarding what it is that we do. And when I talk about evidence, I, there's in that report, it's a pretty darn good report by um, Brain Futures 2019. They talk about some of the evidence-based um, interventions for executive functions, neurofeedback, high quality neurofeedback is evidence-based now. Um, there's some cognitive skill um, programs that are evidence-based. Mindfulness and meditation, when done well, is evidence-based. But the mm. most evidence is about breathing. Mm. Simply breathing. <laughs> Again, totally free. <laughs> yeah. Deep, deep, wonderful, calm breaths. Yeah. So we have we have discussed many many fascinating things. Um, is there something else you would like bring into into this discussion? Um, I I think I just would like to say that I really appreciate this opportunity, and we did talk about so many diverse things. It's so interesting. On my blog at lynnkenny.com, I do have a lot of the research. Um, that I alluded to, and um, I've got most of the links to things too, and I've 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 got more studies to add as well. But I'm I'm not going to do them this week. I'm really busy this week. Um, mm. But it's it's wonderful to be able to talk in a mindful and enthusiastic way about the importance of this, you know, applied neuroscience research and how we can use much of it in order to improve the daily lives of children, families, and educators. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed the discussion because we kind of also speculated, like, you know, when mm -hmm. you discuss with some people, they are like, you ask something and then they are like, the meta-analysis showing that there's no evidence. <laughs> and then it's that, so I really enjoyed this. Um, so could you tell a little bit more about your website, what can be found there, and tell a little bit also about your your books. What books are for good for who, and who would you recommend to read them? Well, Bloom um, was written by Wendy Young and I, and it is I think it's a really good parenting book, and it's a good collaborative parenting book. Um, if people want to kind of understand kind of a brain based way of parenting without punishment, it's 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 got a lot of mantras in it too. We have over 200 mantras because I use mantras um, with families. Um, and then 70 play activities is really probably for clinicians or teachers and brain primers that Mike and I just did are for classrooms. Um, and we've got people making movement messages all around the world. Uh, so that's been really fun. We had, I recently got one from Jim Hart and he's in Florida and then he sent it to Becca Johnston and she's in Australia. And then we're sending it to our friend Jen in Canada. So that's kind of been fun. My next book is um, called Cognomoves and mm -hmm. it's going to be this collection of motor movement activities. Um, and that is due out in 2021. And my website, I haven't written a blog post since July because it's just been a really, really, really busy time. Um, but there's a lot of good blog posts on the site if, if people want the research and they want the activities. And I have a lot of free videos on YouTube. And then all my social media, I do myself. Um, so when I comment on Twitter and stuff, it's just just me being a human and enjoying interacting with people around the world. It's, it's been a great learning experience uh, to be able to meet people, you know? Mm. And, and could you again just say the, the web address so people will find it? Sure. It's just my name, L Y N N E K E N N E Y.com. Yeah. So a lot of, lot of nice things. And I also checked your YouTube channel and you had interesting videos about this, this place that you, you were explaining also here. So if you, if you're interested of those, check also Lynn's uh, YouTube channel. So it, it has been a pleasure to discuss with you. Uh, so what would be your final remarks for, for this episode? Uh, you know, Ollie, the one thing that I really didn't allude to that is foundational and so important is that this whole body of work, you know, helping kids with their executive functions, their self-regulation, their language skills, 
uh, what I really didn't say is that we, the whole process is collaborative, meaning that I introduce the concept and then the children become the teachers right away. And I think that's one of the reasons why our work works. Um, and you mm -hmm. can see on the YouTube um, videos that there are lots of videos where the kids are leading. So even though I just talked with you, you know, for over an hour and it sounds like I'm running it all, what we're just doing mm -hmm. is introducing the concepts to the children and then letting them have agency over the ability to create and collaborate amongst themselves and teach one another. Thanks for joining us this week on Physical Activity Research Through Podcast. If you like the show, make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing or following the show on Twitter. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. If you found value in the show, we would really appreciate a rating on Apple Podcast or whichever app you're using. Or if you would, in a real old school way, simply tell a friend about the show. It would be a great help for us. We have a fantastic lineup of guests for forthcoming episodes, so be sure to tune in. Thank you all for your support and have a great day.